Hey everybody, I have an update for you guys in the Michigan so-called Whitmer kidnapping plot that was obviously a hoax perpetrated by the FBI and what I think everybody now understands was a clear case of entrapment by the federal government. The latest in this uh, case though is um, two of the defendants are seeking acquittal from the conspiracy charges. Now, if you recall, if you've been following my reporting on this case, I've spent the better part of a year dedicated to writing articles about it and covering the case in detail on my show, on uh, another show. Um, I've gone on several other channels and I've talked about this case. Uh, you can go to patriotsoapbox.com or my Substack radixverum.substack.com to read my reporting on the case. I include court documents there uh, as well if you um, need to get caught up on the background of the case. But what essentially happened is the FBI entrapped a group of men um, into a fake plot to kidnap the governor. And the, uh, the entrapment was so obvious and egregious that two of the defendants were acquitted um and they were basically found innocent by the jury and so the jury essentially found that the fbi entrapped these guys um that's what ended up happening now two of them took plea deals very early on ty garbin took an early plea deal and then caleb frank was later pressured into taking a plea deal and I believe February of 2022 as the case was approaching trial. Now, uh, Brandon Caserta and Daniel Harris are the two that were found by the jury to be not guilty. They were uh, acquitted and found innocent. So the other two defendants, um, Adam Fox and Barry Croft, the government said they were going to try to retry the case right against these two men because the jury found a mistrial on the other two, uh, those two individuals. They couldn't come to an, a conclusion. Adam Fox is the um, basically mentally ill man that was living in the basement of a vacuum repair shop that the government claimed was the ringleader of the Wolverine Watchmen militia group, when in fact the real leader and ringleader and orchestrator of everything was an FBI informant named Dan Chappell, also known as Big Dan, code name Thor by the FBI. His handling agent, Jason Chambers, uh, was essentially running a side business called Eggs Intel. This was discovered by um, Ken Benzinger at BuzzFeed. And Axintel was a private so-called intelligence firm seeking multi-million dollar federal contracts to advise the government on matters of what? Domestic terrorism. Now, Jason Chambers was the one who decided uh, very early on to run this case as a TEI investigation, terrorism enterprise investigation. That is something that is reserved for typically uh, multi-state um, terrorism cases. Now, this was before there was any so-called plot to kidnap the governor. And the people who came up with that so-called plot, who came up with the idea for that, was, of course, the FBI. There were over... Uh, 12 FBI informants involved in this investigation, at least two undercover FBI agents that we know of, and the lead, th the three main FBI agents were removed from the witness list. The government did not even want them to testify. Heinrich Impala was accused of perjury in a prior case, and we all know Richard J. Trask was the one who beat the crap out of his wife almost murdered her after they attended a swingers party in Kalamazoo and she didn't want to cuck him. He was intoxicated when he came home. He bashed her head against a nightstand and he tried to strangle her. She was only able to get him off of her by a kick in the ball sack and then he fled in his car while intoxicated. She called police. The body cam footage of that was released. I do have that up on my Gab TV account. 
um, it shows the state that the bedroom was in. You can see blood on the sheets. You can see blood on her face, although her face is blurred out a little bit. But the police were concerned about arresting Mr. Trask because he was involved in counterterrorism. So they're like, yeah, this is a dangerous individual. They ended up getting him on the phone and having him agree to meet them in a parking lot. As the police approach Trask, he is in his truck, he is shirtless, he has blood on him, and he is clearly intoxicated. Why was he not charged with a DUI? Well, we all know it's that FBI privilege. He spent, what, one night in jail for attempted murder, for assault and battery, and of course the jury in that case wasn't allowed to hear about this. Now, what's interesting is that Trask himself also had a side business going on where he was instructing people uh, as a, what is that, personal trainer, or he had his own little private gym he was running. So all of these FBI agents appear to have side hustles going on. Just how much money do they need? But also, Trask had been making anti-Trump Facebook posts. Those were discovered. And of course, the jury wasn't allowed to hear any of that. So that's the three lead agents of this, Heinrich Impala, Richard J. Trask, and Jason Chambers, all involved in corruption. An early prosecutor in the case, uh, Townsend, Gregory Townsend, was removed also because he was corrupt as well. And he also had been... Uh, there were allegations of perjury and um, seeking special deals with informants in a prior case. So that is a little bit of background on it. So um, the latest in this is that the two men accused of plotting to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer in 2020 have filed a motion for acquittal following a federal jury's failure to reach a verdict against them. The motions from Adam Fox and Barry Croft follow a federal jury's April 8th decision to find Wolverine watchman Daniel Harris and Brandon Caserta not guilty of conspiring to kidnap Whitmer. Jurors failed to reach a verdict on Fox and Croft. Prosecutors immediately announced their intention to retry Adam Fox and Barry Croft, but those men filed motions on April 22nd for U.S. District Judge Robert Yonker to grant them a judgment of acquittal. In their separate motions, Fox and Croft reiterate arguments they've made since their October 2020 arrest that they were entrapped into the conspiracy by federal law enforcement. Fox's attorney Christopher Gibbon said testimony from undercover informants during the trial provided further evidence of entrapment. FBI informant Dan Chappell admitted that he had suggested looking for the governor's vacation house on August 9, 2020, and that he had invited Adam Fox to go along on the ride-along trip. Dan also admitted that he had the Realtor app on his phone to find the governor's address, not Adam Fox. So Fox is the ringleader, guys, but he doesn't even know how to find where he's going. It's actually Dan that's leading this. Unbelievable. Dan admitted that he provided the paper and pen to Fox on which Fox drew the infamous map, he said. Yeah, it was, oh, hey, draw this map for me. And then they take and go, oh, see, look, he drew a map, guys. He had a plan. There was a plan. But the plan all came from the FBI. Adam Fox would never have joined the Wolverine Watchmen if it wasn't for Dan bringing him into the group. By the way, against the wishes of other members of the group. Dan also admitted that Adam Fox did not keep the map and that he had personally taken the map and given it to the FBI. It's something to make that looks incriminating, but it really was not any kind of plan. Gibbons also argued that the government had failed to prove its case against his client. During the trial, the government produced evidence that Adam Fox was prone to speaking offensively, making objectively anti-government statements and juvenile remarks, casually advocating violence, he said. Yeah, but none of that is illegal. You're allowed to criticize the government in America, and you're allowed to make uh, remarks casually advocating violence as long as it's not imminent threats. There is a difference. It's not incitement. All of this evidence, quote unquote, was intended to create the inference that Adam Fox was engaged in a sophisticated paramilitary exercise 
designed to kidnap the governor. The government did not provide any evidence that Fox was even communicating with any of the other defendants to agree or plan or conspire, otherwise pursue the kidnapping of the governor. The evidence presented by the government was insufficient. Cross attorney Josh Blanchard said another trial would actually violate the double jeopardy clause, which is the principle that the government should not be allowed to make repeated attempts to convict an individual for an alleged offense. He also argued that the government's case against his client was further diminished by the not guilty verdict of Harris, who was alleged to have conspired with Croft about blowing up a bridge as part of the plot. Since Harris has been acquitted of possessing an explosive device, then Croft should be too, Blanchard said. Uh, quote, in acquitting Mr. Harris, the jury necessarily determined that either the device was not a destructive device or that Mr. Harris did not know that the device was a destructive device, unquote. He said, if the conclusion was that the device was not a destructive device, the government should be precluded from relitigating that issue. And Mr. Croft is entitled to an acquittal. If, however, the jury determined Mr. Harris did not know the object was a destructive device, Mr. Croft is still entitled to an acquittal because the government failed to present any more evidence regarding Mr. Croft's knowledge of the status of the device as compared to Mr. Harris. Prosecutors have not yet responded to the defendants, nor has Judge Yonker set a date for the motions to be heard. Now, a sentencing hearing for Caleb Franks, who took a plea deal to the charges in February, is scheduled for June 8th. The federal trial is separate from a state case involving defendants Joseph Morrison, Pete Musico, and Paul Beller, who are accused of providing material support to the kidnap plotters. Their trial is set to begin in September, and I think that it will be very interesting to see how that goes and see what happens here because uh, it was a it, it's so, such a clear case of entrapment um and this was supposed to be the biggest domestic terror case of the decade you know you had all of these fbi agents running it as a terrorism enterprise investigation and when you if you followed the case like i did um listening in to the trial each day for hours upon hours uh, listening to audio and, you know, looking at the evidence, the text messages between the, the FBI informants and their handling agents, it was clear that the entire thing was instigated and created by the FBI. They, at one point, FBI Special Agent Jason Chambers sends a text message to the main FBI informant, Dan Chappell. He says, the plan is to, is to, the mission is to kill the governor. They were trying to get another guy in Virginia to do the same thing. They were trying to set this up. They actually wanted this to be a multi-state militia thing so they could say, oh, look at these militias. They're trying to kidnap and kill governors. And what I find interesting is that during the COVID lockdowns, uh, President Trump had sent out tweets like, uh, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia, liberate Wisconsin. And these were the states that the FBI was operating in with fake militia groups that they created with another FBI informant, Steve Robson, who, by the way, was a career criminal, a longtime government informant currently facing charges for fraud, a weapons charge. Um, this They had him create a nationwide meeting of so-called militia groups where he was trying to get people to uh, basically storm the capital, the state capitals. You know, it seems like there's another connection with, with the Whitmer case in January 6th, like the trial run 
to what happened on January 6th. And it's interesting, too, that the lead FBI agent from the Detroit field office, Michael D'Antuono, is immediately promoted to head up the Washington, D.C. field office right after these guys are arrested and indicted in October of 2020, which, by the way, was right before the presidential election. You had uh, Gretchen Whitmer going on TV, doing press conferences. Oh, my gosh. Trump incited right-wing terrorism. These people wanted to kill me. At no point was this woman ever in danger. In fact, the FBI had set up poll cams. That's 24-7 real-time surveillance of her cottage home. And they were the ones doing the drive-by. It was the FBI. You even had undercover agents in these cars. The FBI provided all of the the vehicles, they paid for the travel, they bought these guys meals, they got them drunk, they got them stoned. It, it, they they did this. I mean, these guys didn't have money. One of them was literally homeless and living in the basement of a vacuum repair shop. It is so egregious. If you actually look at what happened, that quite frankly, the FBI should be ashamed of themselves and someone should be held accountable since they've basically been found guilty of entrapping innocent American citizens, taking advantage of people being upset about the COVID lockdowns and economically depressed, taking advantage of the chaos from the rioting that occurred, um, the social justice rioting after George Floyd. That's what they were doing, guys. And it's, it's very sad. But will we see Jason Chambers held to account? No. Has he been fired from the FBI? No. Has anyone asked why the hell he created a private intelligence firm, ex-Intel, that was seeking multi-million dollar government contracts while he's working for the FBI? How not that a conflict of interest? And yet, nothing has happened to him. So I will continue to keep you guys updated on this case. To read all of my articles on it, go to patriotsoapbox.com and just type in... Um, Whitmer kidnapping, and you'll find uh, over 20 articles I've written about this going into detail, linking documents, going through everything, breaking it down for you guys. You can also find some of those articles on my Substack. Uh, just do the same kind of search, and you'll be able to find it. So hopefully, it is my hope that Baron Croft and Adam Fox get acquitted. I hope that the judge grants these motions. And by the way, if you're wondering how Barry Croft came onto the radar of the FBI in the first place, you'll find this interesting. But he came to the attention of the FBI in 2017 because he had criticized the FBI on Facebook. Now, that is not illegal. Americans are allowed to criticize federal agencies. They're allowed to criticize the government. You're not supposed to be able to monitor them unless you have probable cause and a warrant. But that's not what happened. We learned that the FBI began monitoring people because of so-called anti-law enforcement and anti-government rhetoric. So what does that mean? What does that tell you about the current state of America? Indeed, it is disturbing. If you guys have any comments or any questions, let me know. Uh, in the comments section below. I'll try to answer all of your questions. Um, and if you want to hear more about this, let me know. Maybe I will do a longer video going into detail about some of my reporting on this case.